GraphQL is something we've been hearing about for a while now. Though I will admit, I've not given it more than a quick Google or tutorial here and there. Those who use it seem to really enjoy it. Those who are constantly making small changes to REST endpoints to refine the query parameters or block out fields certain users shouldn't be able to see do not really seem to enjoy it. Or am I just speaking for myself? ETE is very excited to introduce developer experience engineer at Apollo GraphQL, Janessa Garo, Garo, who pre-recorded this talk because she was unaware if she would be able to make it as she's due to have a baby here very soon. A big congrats and good luck from everyone here at ETE, Janessa. Janessa was, actually, was able to make it actually. She is joined by developer relations manager at Apollo, at Apollo Michael Watson. They will take your questions after the presentation. Thanks for joining us, Janessa and Michael. And their education team to provide resources for learning all things Apollo and GraphQL. You can find me on Twitter at Janessa Garrow or on GitHub at Jay Garrow. And today, We'll be talking about the three W's of GraphQL, the what, when, and why. You've probably heard of GraphQL. An increasing number of companies and developers are adopting it. So with the growing popularity, how do you know if it's worth your time or something you should be using? So today, we'll be discussing what GraphQL is, why it's a great tool to use as your application needs grow and scale, and when are appropriate use cases for it. GraphQL was created by Facebook back in 2012, when they were still Facebook, as an improved data fetching approach that they could use across the company's services. In their words, they, do, they wanted a data fetching API powerful enough to describe all of Facebook, yet simple enough to be easy to learn and use by product developers. And then in 2015, Facebook open sourced GraphQL and now all of us can use it. But what exactly is GraphQL? Put simply, GraphQL is a query language, the QL in GraphQL. Similar to other query languages like SQL, GraphQL is a language for querying data. The difference is that GraphQL isn't used to query a particular type of data store like a Postgres database. Instead, GraphQL is used to query data from a variety of different data sources. In this way, GraphQL aims to be a modern approach to modern applications. In today's web, applications and user interfaces are increasingly complex and rely on data from a variety of sources. So GraphQL allows developers to use a common query language to request all of the data regardless of where it's coming from. The backbone of a GraphQL server is called the schema. The schema describes the shape of all available data and defines a hierarchy of types and fields that will be populated from your backend data stores. So the schema acts like a menu or a contract between the server and client, defining what the GraphQL API can and can't do and how clients can request or alter data. The syntax for a schema follows what's called the schema definition language or SDL. If you're familiar with JavaScript, it looks pretty similar to objects. At its core, a schema is a collection of object types that contain fields. And each field has its own type, which can be scalar like an int or a string or even another object type. So let's say we have a cat astronaut or space cat. This space cat type has some different data we can get. It has a name field, which can be a string. It has an age field, which is an integer and a missions field, which is a list of mission object types for
for the different space missions this space cat has been on. We can even be nitpicky about whether or not we want certain fields to be able to return a null value by adding an exclamation point to the field type. Now with our schema in place, the front end knows exactly what the data will look like when it comes back from the server, and the back end knows what shape the response needs to be. When building an app or a feature with GraphQL, it's best practice to use a schema first approach. With this approach, we want to implement our app or our feature based on the exact data that we need. As a first step, we want to define our schema to, de to identify which data our feature requires. Then we can structure our schema in a way that can provide that data to our client as intuitively as possible. Then we can build out the front end and back end implementations in parallel. The back end team can build out the API using the schema as the source of truth for the shape of the data they should be providing. And the front end team can use that same schema to create accurate mocks while waiting for the API to be available. A schema first approach like this helps speed up development and helps keep everyone aligned on the needs of the client. When using a schema first approach and knowing what our client needs are, we can think about our data as a collection of objects like a book and authors and the relationships between those objects, like how books have an author. If we think about each object as a node and each relationship as an edge, we can create a mental picture of our entire data model as a collection of nodes and edges that we call the graph. Once we have the schema, we can make requests to tell the API what data we want and what we want to do with it, we use what's called GraphQL operations. In GraphQL, there are two different types, queries and mutations. For fetching data, we use a query. And to make any data changes, we use a mutation. GraphQL APIs themselves run on a server and are typically served over HTTP. The GraphQL server is responsible for receiving incoming queries, validating those queries against the schema, and then returning the populated schema fields as a response. GraphQL doesn't care where the data comes from, making it data source agnostic. So your data could come from a REST API, a database, or any microservice. Since GraphQL is typically served over HTTP, operations are just strings. Our GraphQL query is just a string that gets sent to the server, which then sends back a JSON response. We don't need any special tools to query data from a GraphQL server. Granted, there are lots of awesome tools out there to give you extra resources, but you don't need anything other than the browser's built-in fetch API to make a GraphQL request. On the right here, we have an example of sending a GraphQL query using the browser's fetch API. And on the left is what that query looks like in your request payload, which you can see if you peek in your browser's network panel. And as you can see, your request gets sent as just a big string version of your query. So let's take a look at what this looks like in the network tab. So here we're just in our browser. We can just use the console because we're using the built-in fetch API. We have our endpoint that we're going to send our request to using a post method so that we can send a body and we'll send our query in that body along with any variables that it needs. 
So once we send our request, we get that promise. So now we know that the request was sent. So if we look at our network panel to what happened with that request, we'll see that the payload truly is just a big string of our GraphQL query. But what happens once our query is sent to the server? When the server receives our HTTP request, it first extracts that query string to parse and transform it into a tree structured document called an abstract syntax tree or AST. Then with this AST, the server validates this query against the types and fields in our schema. If something in our query is off, like if we request a field that's not defined in our schema, the server will throw an error and send it back to the client. If everything looks okay, the server carries on and processes and fetches that requested data. The server traverses the AST and for each field in our query, it will invoke that field's resolver function. A resolver function exists to resolve its field by populating it with the correct data from the correct source, like a database or a REST API. As each field for our query is resolved, the data is all put together into a JSON object whose shape matches the shape of our query. Then this JSON object gets assigned to the HTTP response body's data key and gets sent back to the client. Now that we have a better understanding of what GraphQL is and does, let's talk adjectives. GraphQL's approach to querying data results in some key characteristics. First, GraphQL is declarative. As we saw in previous slides, GraphQL queries mirror their JSON response. This makes it much easier to both read and understand your queries and makes the data easier to work with. Next, GraphQL is hierarchical. The hierarchical nature of GraphQL allows for relationships between different kinds of data. Simplifying requests by avoiding multiple REST endpoint requests or complex SQL join statements. GraphQL is also strongly typed. This means a more stable API, fewer bugs in development, and enables you to have more descriptive error messages. GraphQL is also introspective. Since a GraphQL server can be queried for the different types it supports, this allows for all different kinds of great tooling. There are even cool tools out there that can auto-generate your API docs, your TypeScript types for your resolvers, and a lot more. GraphQL is performant. Since GraphQL allows you to request exactly the data you want, front-end applications are often more performant since they're able to avoid both over and under fetching. GraphQL is also decoupled. GraphQL servers decouple your client applications from the server. Using the schema as the contract for what the data response will look like, both front-end and back-end teams can build independently and simultaneously from each other. GraphQL is also versioning friendly. It doesn't have versions in the same way that REST APIs do, but GraphQL allows you to add flags to different types and fields to let users know if something is being changed, such as a deprecation warning. This allows developers to both work on new features while still being backwards compatible as older features are gradually sunset. And lastly, GraphQL is scalable. Especially if you use an approach called federation, 
GraphQL fits nicely into a microservice architecture. Federation enables backend teams to independently maintain their own services and tie them together into a single graph for clients to consume. We'll get into some of these characteristics in more detail later, but to recap, GraphQL is a query language and server runtime that typically runs over HTTP. GraphQL was designed to be more efficient, performant, and provide a better developer experience for working with data in a client-server architecture. Now that we have a better idea of what GraphQL is, how can you tell if GraphQL is the right tool for you? Why should you use GraphQL instead of something like, say, a REST API? You can do CRUD operations, authenticate requests, and send different kinds of data with both. So let's go over a few advantages of using GraphQL. First, a client-focused API. Front-end and back-end teams all know exactly what the data will look like. Second, type safety. API stability, fewer bugs, better error messages. Faster development. Work independently and simultaneously with other teams. Fourth, improved documentation. Human-readable schemas and documentation comments. Fifth, reduced code complexity. Only make one request no matter how many data sources you have. And finally, improved data fetching. Make one request, get exactly what you need, no more, no less. So first, a client-focused API. GraphQL gives you the flexibility to create a schema, an API, that is focused on the client's needs. So rather than having your API built in a way that reflects the underlying structure of the data, or how the data is stored or represented, and then making the client deal with having to figure out how to get all the information they need, GraphQL flips things around. With GraphQL, the client helps determine the schema and informs what data they need and what the relationships are, and the API is then built accordingly. Approaching an API in this way also helps add consistency across multiple clients like web, mobile, or watch. Having an API structured according to client needs can eliminate the need for different backends for different clients because they'll be enabled to share the same singular GraphQL API. Second, type safety. With a GraphQL schema, type safety is built into the API. Both the front end and back end teams know what type all requestable fields have to be. This way, teams can develop with confidence knowing that there's a shared source of truth of the shape and types of the data. Not only does this allow you to develop with confidence with the current state of your API, but it also enables you to feel confident with subsequent updates to the API. Any breaking changes won't be a surprise because you'll always know what shape the payload will be. For example, in this SpaceCat type, clients know that when they request the age, it will always be an integer as opposed to a string. When they request a name, it will always be a string and it will never be a null value. Being able to have confidence in the shape of the data that comes back from the API helps front-end developers approach their implementation in a way that can rely on these data types. Third, fast development cycles. GraphQL enables front-end and back-end teams to iterate rapidly. Once a schema has been agreed upon, both teams can work independently. Since everyone knows exactly the shape the payload will be, front-end teams can mock the data responses based off of the schema while waiting for back-end changes to be ready. And back-end teams just have to create resolver functions 
that access the proper data sources and return data in the shape specified by the schema. They don't need to worry about endpoint conventions or changing resources because they will already know via the schema the data requirements of the client. And because of the introspective nature of GraphQL, there are also cool tools out there like GraphQL Code Generator or the Apollo CLI that can automatically generate other code you might need, like your TypeScript types, just based off your schema. This can help speed up development and reduce errors as you're developing. Fourth, improved documentation. GraphQL is sometimes said to be self-documenting. While this is true in the sense that the more human readable syntax of a schema and the strong typing makes it clear what data can be requested, we shouldn't rely solely on this self-documentation. Thankfully, GraphQL also allows you to write comments directly in your schema code alongside your types and fields, as pointed out with these arrows here. Since this kind of documentation lives so close to the actual code, it's also easier to remember to update it when changes are made to the schema. And we all know there's nothing worse than outdated docs. If you use a query builder tool like Graphical, GraphQL Playground, or Apollo's Studio Explorer to help you build your queries, you'll notice that any comments in the schema are also populated in these tools to help give you more insight about the data without having to go look at the source code itself, which is pretty handy. So here we have a screenshot of documentation in Graphical, the original GraphQL playground or query builder tool. So let's take a look at what this looks like in action. So here we are in Graphical. We're using the Star Wars GraphQL API. And in our query, we're requesting all films. And for each film, we're going to get the title and the opening crawl. And on the right hand side here, we can pull open the docs, which will pull open a clickable view of the schema. So we have our root query. We're requesting all films. And within all films, we're getting a list of films. And you can see there are these comment descriptions. And these are the comments from the actual schema itself. So the title field is the title of the film. And the opening crawl is those opening paragraphs at the beginning of this film. And then we can run our query and get our list of films. So as we can see, after we get our data, we have the title and that opening crawl. Now, if we hop over to look at GraphQL Playground, here we have a screenshot of what that looks like. Also with the Docs tab pulled open on the right hand side to show the schema as well as some documentation. So let's take a look at what GraphQL Playground looks like. So here we are in GraphQL Playground, another query builder tool. And here we're using a Pokemon GraphQL API. From our query, we can see we're getting a list of Pokemon, limiting it to six, and we're going to grab the name and the gender rate. And just like in graphical, there's a docs panel on the right. We're querying all Pokemon, and that's going to give us a list of Pokemon. And let's say we want to know more about that gender rate field. So we can come down here to that and click on it, and we'll see that there is a comment description about it, which again would also be found in the actual schema. So in this case, we can learn that this is going to be a float and the value of this, what it means is that it's the percent chance of that queried Pokemon of being female. So if we run our query, we get a list of the first six Pokemon 
and their percent chance of being female. And now let's hop over to Apollo Studio Explorer. Once again, another query builder tool. If you're not familiar with it, Apollo Studio is actually a cloud platform that helps you build, validate, and secure your organization's graph. And their Explorer Query Builder tool is just one of the many features. So here's a screenshot of it. It's a little bit different in layout. The docs and the schema are on the left-hand side, but otherwise pretty similar. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here we are in Apollo Studio Explorer. Again, we're going to use that same Pokemon GraphQL API that we used in GraphQL Playground. We're gonna make that same query again, gonna get a list of Pokemon, limiting it to six, getting the name and the gender rate. So on our schema on the left, we can click on that field and all Pokemon will see it gets a range of Pokemon and if we want to know again, say about that gender rate, if we click on that, there's that comment description again. And if we run our query, we get those same results that we saw in GraphQL Playground. The cool thing about Apollo Studio is that unlike Graphical and GraphQL Playground, Studio offers a host of other features aside from query building and documentation. You can use the schema registry to track changes and even create variants of your schema for different environments. You can get metrics reporting, team collaboration, get notifications for schema changes, and even manage your federated graphs. There are other features that Studio offers too, but even when it comes to just query building, I think some of Studio's coolest features are operations collections which lets you save a query to an operation in a folder. So then you can save them. Now you can close all of the tabs that you have open. I know we all always have a million tabs open, but you can also just copy a link to your operation and send that to someone. This is super helpful when onboarding other people or even just developing an API and you want to get some input from someone else on a query that you're working on. Moving on from improved documentation, GraphQL can help reduce code complexity. If you need data from multiple sources, like from different REST endpoints, third-party APIs, different microservices, your client app might have to juggle making lots of different requests. With GraphQL, you can use something like schema stitching or Apollo Federation to combine schemas for different data sources into a single schema. Then the client only has to worry about making a single request and let GraphQL abstract away the complexity of requesting data from the correct places for you. This can greatly simplify the code complexity on the client side by having all the requests for all of the data coming from just one place. And there are even cool tools out there like Apollo Client that can be used to both make your GraphQL requests and manage your state. And lastly, we have improved data fetching. GraphQL allows you to request exactly what data you need. No more, no less. Make one request, get predictable data. This is an especially noteworthy improvement if you're coming from a REST API. A common problem with REST APIs is a concept called overfetching. When you request an endpoint, you get all of the data at that endpoint, even if you need only one or two resources. And now you have all this unnecessary data. So let's take a look at a REST API to visualize and see this overfetching concept. So here we have the Pokey API, which is a public REST API. We can request a single Pokemon and get information about it. 
So here we've requested information for one called Umbreon, and this particular endpoint gives us back all of this different data about it. So overfetching would be if we only needed, say, we just wanted the name. Well, when we hit this endpoint, we get everything about abilities, forms, moves. We get all of this extra data, even though we only needed this one name field. So that's potentially a really big payload for a very small data need on the client. On the flip side, REST APIs also have a problem with underfetching. This issue arises when the data you need on the client is spread out over multiple REST endpoints. This results in having to make multiple requests to get everything you need. And this is worsened if you need to endpoint hop. You know you need information at endpoint B, but to request that, you need to first request endpoint A to get the URL for endpoint B. This can snowball and lead to a chain of waterfall network requests, which can slow down your app since you have to wait for all of those requests to be made to get all the data you need. You get the worst of both worlds, underfetching, which results in overfetching. So let's go back to that Pokey API and see what underfetching looks like there. So here we are back in Pokey API. We've requested data from that initial Pokemon endpoint for Umbreon. And let's say our app needs to know some information about this particular Pokemon's abilities. So we can see here that at this endpoint, the only information we get about its abilities are the name, whether or not it's hidden. We won't worry too much about what that means. And then a URL for another endpoint to get information about that ability. So if we wanted more information about this ability than just the name, we would have to then go make another request at that endpoint to get all the information for that ability. So you can see if you wanted information specifically about the Pokemon Umbreon, you want its name, its abilities, and then maybe a description about those abilities, you have to request two endpoints. But to get the second endpoint, you need to get it from the first one. So this is an example of underfetching where all the information you need is in two different endpoints, but you also get the overfetching part of you still get all of the information from both endpoints, regardless of how much of that information you actually need. So GraphQL helps to solve this issue by allowing clients to pick and choose what pieces of data they want, and that's the only thing that they get. You don't have to endpoint hop, it just all comes to you. Now, something to keep in mind with data fetching in GraphQL, the phrase improved data fetching is often one of the most common points talked about, but there are some important caveats. The technical details of overfetching actually might not change much because you're just moving all of that work and data parsing from the client and moving it to the server. So while the client will be cleaner, your server might still be having to handle that big payload. So this could take up more memory for your server and impact your deployment costs and scale. But despite these trade-offs, there are still performance gains to be had here. Even though the amount of actual work and data fetching is the same, the server is still more likely to be able to make requests faster than the client, especially if your users have a slow internet connection. And you can also make further improvements with things like caching on your server to help mitigate those. But at the end of the day, to ultimately optimize performance with GraphQL, 
you'll probably want to move away from something like REST that always gets a pig payload and have your GraphQL resolvers access the data directly to get what they need. So to recap some of the advantages of GraphQL, you get a client-focused API, type safety, fast development, improved documentation, reduced code complexity, and improved client data fetching. There are certainly trade-offs as with everything. Caching is a bit more difficult with GraphQL. Still very possible though, especially with great tools like Apollo Client or GraphCDN. And GraphQL requires a bit of a mental model shift. But if your app could benefit from any of these advantages, it might be something worth considering. Okay, great, GraphQL has some niceties, but does that make it a good tool for a small startup? A bigger enterprise, side projects, everything in between? Let's start with when you might not need GraphQL. You might not need it if you work with a static site. If your pages are generated at build time, then it probably doesn't matter too much how performant the data fetching is since your users aren't going to have to wait for those requests anyway. You might not need GraphQL if the data needs of your client are pretty simple, if the relationships between your data aren't complex, or if your app just doesn't need much data in general, GraphQL might be overkill. And a little on the silly side, you might not need GraphQL if you enjoy wasting hours on out-of-date API documentation, you love getting more data than you need on the client, or, this one's pretty real, you're tired of learning yet another piece of tech. So, if none of those use cases apply to you, GraphQL might be a good fit for you if your client requests data from multiple sources or multiple APIs. Your backend is managed by multiple teams that you want to be able to work independently from one another, but still contribute to the same API. Or if you even just have multiple different kinds of clients like web, mobile, watch, tablet, but want them to share the same API instead of having to maintain separate APIs for each of them, like a BFF or backend for front end. If you decide that GraphQL is right for you, or you just want to try it out, how do you know how to best approach it for your app? Not all apps are created equal, so while GraphQL can be a great tool for any kind of app, almost, the implementation can vary depending on your needs. If you're working on a side project or a small startup that's just trying to get up and running fast, there are some great tools out there like Hasura or GraphCMS that can build your GraphQL API for you to get you up and running. Then you can use GraphQL on the client to make requests. Not everyone has the resources, time, money, technical knowledge to write a backend server themselves so th these are some great options to help you prioritize things and still take advantage of the benefits of GraphQL. If you have an existing API or APIs that your app uses, you can even adopt GraphQL incrementally. A nifty thing about GraphQL is that it doesn't care where your data comes from. You can have a schema that resolves data coming from different kinds of data sources like REST, Postgres databases, microservices, etc. And you can even incrementally migrate an existing REST API to GraphQL to fit your needs and your priorities. So here you can see a list of just a few of the many, many GraphQL tools out there, and there is a wide variety. They range from tooling libraries like Apollo's Rover and other CLIs, client libraries like Apollo Client and Urkel, and even server and ORM libraries like Apollo Server and Hasura. And even within these different categories of tools, 
There are also tools for a variety of different languages from JavaScript to Java, Kotlin, Rust, Ruby. Do some research, see what's out there. If you've decided that GraphQL is for you, next it's time to decide how you should structure your API. You could go the monolithic approach and have all of your schemas and resolvers be interconnected, or you can go the federated route where you have more of a separation of concerns between your different schemas and resolvers. Let's take a look first at a monolithic server where different teams contribute to the same GraphQL server. If you have data coming from multiple sources, things can get cluttered pretty quickly. It can be challenging to represent an entire enterprise scale graph with a monolithic GraphQL server. Performance might degrade as your users and features increase and teams across your organization are all committing changes to the same application. As the application grows, monolithic servers become increasingly difficult to maintain. The more teams or developers that are making changes to it, the harder it is to release changes because everyone's code impacts each other. And what happens if each team is implementing only according to their team's data needs? And even if it only happens with one team, which is usually the initial implementation in a monolithic server. This means that those schemas and types are probably structured differently from other teams. So let's take a look at this example. The billing team wants access to user information by requesting users who have booked any trip, flights, hotels, any kind of booking. But the team building hotels only cares about users who have booked a trip specifically with that hotel. While this is a very simplistic example and easily fixable, in a monolithic implementation, it's likely that both teams would write their own resolvers and probably duplicate fetching logic for the service that provides that user data. Duplicated code makes everything harder to maintain and scale and everything starts to get messy. So what if you still wanna keep different kinds of data separate and managed by separate teams, but still get the advantages that come with having a single GraphQL schema? And this is where federation comes in. Apollo Federation lets teams build and operate services independently while contributing to the same overall graph. Let each service implement just the part of the graph it's responsible for. Empower your teams to go faster while embracing a single source of truth for your graph. Essentially, federation is an architecture for creating modularized graphs. So no more monolithic schema. With federation, your schema is split up by concerns, eliminating those duplication problems while still keeping different types as contained as possible and without exposing different subgraph schemas to each other. Each subgraph schema is responsible for its own data and for its own resolvers. It becomes easier to scale, make changes, and understand what's going on in the code because there's a separation of concerns between the different subgraphs. The client can still request the data they need, but our server has been structured in such a way to be better organized, understandable, and scalable. And who doesn't love better organization? By federating your graph, you can reduce performance and productivity bottlenecks simultaneously. Each team can maintain their own subgraph independently, and your graph's gateway serves primarily to route incoming operations, not to resolve each of them completely. And even if your application needs aren't quite at this level of complexity, adopting federation early can help make scaling easier by getting you set up with a more flexible, more maintainable architecture earlier on.
One of the biggest advantages of Federation is that different teams can build a schema and API for their service and iterate it on it independently. Then each of those smaller graphs feeds into a single common graph so that clients still only have to worry about sending queries to one place. This allows different services the possibility to be written in different languages or be hosted in different locations because they're still independent from one another. This approach to GraphQL is especially great because it gives you the best of the worlds of organization, modularization, and team independence, as well as a simplification for data access for clients. Whew, we've covered a lot in a short amount of time. We did a brief overview of what GraphQL is. It's a query language that can bring you benefits such as simplifying your requests, speeding up development, type safety, improved documentation, and there are a plethora of tools out there that can make GraphQL a good fit for your app's use case and level of complexity, whether that's greenfield project to complex enterprise scale. And with a little bit of research and an open mind, GraphQL can help you take your application to the next level. If your interest has been piqued, but you're not sure where to start learning, here are some of my favorite GraphQL learning resources. Disclaimer, I'm a bit biased towards Apollo Odyssey because I help build that platform, but my awesome coworkers have made some great quality educational content there, and they're always continuing to work on more. There's also a great full stack tutorial on howtographql.com. If you're more of a live teaching kind of person, Moon Highway Workshops with Eve Porcello are fantastic. She is a fabulous teacher. The official GraphQL docs are always a great, reliable resource. Shruti Kapoor, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong, has a great guide on getting started with GraphQL. And Apollo has a nice, super quick video overview of what GraphQL is and the concept of the graph. I'll share these slides after the event for those who are interested so you can grab any links. And if you have any favorite learning resources that aren't mentioned here, I'd love to hear about them. Thanks for joining me today to talk about GraphQL. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Janessa Garrow, and I hope you all stick around for some questions. Thank you very much. That was awesome and very informative. Um, I see that you answered some uh, some of the questions in Slack. I don't know if it's worth like going through those. I do felt like those answers were, you know, pretty illuminating. Actually, I was reading through them. And... Yeah, I mean, we can. I can go through them just for those people that aren't in the Slack or might have missed the answer. Um, so one of the questions was if. Your GraphQL schema or query is created based on the client. How does it ensure that the schema can support all types of clients like web, watch, mobile? Um, so essentially, if you're using a client-first approach when creating your, your schema and your GraphQL API, it removes the need for different BFFs or backend for front ends where you might have separate backend APIs for different clients because they have different data needs and data requirements. But because GraphQL lets the client request whatever data they want, it kind of eliminates the need to have different ones because they can all just pick and choose what they want. And then you just need to add new fields to your schema as new requirements arise. So hope that answered the question. Um, anyone has any follow-up questions or if that wasn't quite clear enough, definitely let us know. And then let's see, the next question was, how can GraphQL be best used for a constantly evolving schema? So when you're basically with your API is constantly changing. So this is where something called the schema registry is helpful. 
um, because with a schema registry, you can validate changes to your schema before they actually go live to help you know if you're going to break anything so you don't actually break production. Um, and usually, if you are making a breaking change, you'll actually want to create a new field so that you don't break the existing stuff. And you can add a deprecation flag for the old one that you want to eventually remove so that the users that are still using that one know, hey, it's still supported, we're gonna get rid of it, but you should probably switch to this newer one. And then obviously updating your documentation in your schema um, so that everything is as clear and up to date as possible. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add so far? <laughs> No, I, I think you I think you got it pretty covered. You know, one of the other things when you think of your graph evolving over time, you want to be really flexible with that. You know, typically if you start out on a new project, maybe you have a website, but we build projects for them to be successful. And so, you know, as that project gets successful and grows, maybe you get requests for a mobile app. It's kind of the same shape, but maybe you don't display certain fields on it. And maybe now you have different modals that have different shaped queries. And maybe that changes the shape of some of the types in your schema. And you wanna just add to your schema and have it grow as those use cases come in and you have that client centric approach. Uh, but eventually your graph kind of evolves to a platform in, in a sense where you start thinking about how does my API serve the data as a platform to all of my clients' needs? And that's when we're talking about, you know, there's graphs of projects that have 50, 100, you know, hundreds of different client applications all consuming the same data sets, but with different contexts. I'm an internal customer support employee using my customer support app versus like using the actual public e-commerce website to buy something. So you want to be flexible with that. And, and GraphQL makes that really easy. Janessa mentioned the, the deprecated field, which is one of the most common ways people will evolve their graph and prune off those deprecated fields when they see the usage drop off. Uh, well, let's see. Just trying to make sure I didn't miss any questions. <clears throat> There was one that just popped up a minute ago about hosting in uh, AWS Lambda and Azure Functions. Mm -hmm. um, there are Apollo server packages for those environments to host. I've actually run plenty of Apollo server instances in both Lambda and Azure Functions. Um, I actually came from Microsoft before Apollo working in Azure, so I'm a big Azure Functions fan. Um, no problems inside of there. It's it's. Great experience, actually. Um, I have a lot of customers also that run uh, various servers inside of Lambda. Um, you know, there are a lot of public um, blog posts out there. I think Indeed's got one out there of them hosting in Lambda. Um, I, I know CNN did some talks in the past at, at Fastly's conference about how they're running their GraphQL servers in Lambdas. Um, so definitely a common architecture inside of there. I did just want to give the heads up that the meeting will automatically end at 1230. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all the questions yep. that were previously posted in Slack. So we can so, wrap it up now if you guys are, if that's yeah. all the questions and we're uh, good to go. Thank you both so much. This was awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the great thanks questions. So